Good morning and welcome to worship this morning on this third Sunday of Advent. I am the Reverend Kayla Johnson, and on behalf of our session and staff here at First Presbyterian Church of Ann Arbor, we'd like to welcome you to worship with us this morning. On this third Sunday of Advent, we are celebrating joy. When the Lord restores the fortune of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. If you are not already signed up to receive devotionals, you may do so online by contacting someone in the church office as well. Our Advent devotionals are based on our theme, Those Who Dream. Now this year's Story Slam 2020 for Those Who Dream will be presented today virtually at 7 p.m. and you don't want to miss what's happening there. There will also be a brief virtual reception afterwards. Also, our fast track to new membership is happening today at 12 noon. And for those who would like to join, you can find more information on the website or contact Reverend Rogers. Beginning today, this Sunday, December 13th, from 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m., Advent is happening here at First Press. Again, that's 3.30 until 5 p.m. We're inviting those who are interested to drive through the campus and visit various stations to celebrate this Advent season. Everyone will be masked and socially distant. Staff and volunteers will be here to greet you, and more information can be found on the website as well as in the bulletin today. During this time of isolation, it is important to reach out to those in need. There are many opportunities for you and your family to participate during this Advent season, including family to family, holiday toy donations, and also other possibilities in volunteering around the community. Financial contributions as well as food donations will be accepted throughout the month, and more information can also be found online. I do also have one pastoral note to share with you today. We celebrate the life and grieve the death of Catherine Beard, who died on last Sunday, December 6th. We hold her family in our prayers. Now let us prepare our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, and our dreams for worship this morning. Here we are on the third Sunday of Advent, lighting the third tree for joy.
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The world says worry, and we say rejoice. The news says fear, and we say rejoice. The world says be happy, and the church says be faithful. As we light our third Advent candle, we pray, we pray for, for hope, hope, peace, peace and, and joy. joy. Come now, O child of Mary. Come, Come now, now, O Prince of Joy. joy. Habits and new wrongs wear ruts through our lives and relationships. But God is able to restore us. Like water coursing through a dry desert, the waters of baptism flow through us, reminding us that we belong to God and raising us to new life. Trusting in God's saving grace, let us confess our sin before God and each other. O oh, great writer of dreams and mysteries, with a sky full of stars and a world full of flowers, there should be no end to our joy. And yet, instead of decorating our very being with joy, we let it slip away like loose change. Instead of singing like Mary or dancing like David, we pass by remarkable beauty and love most days, unfazed. Forgive us, teach us the ways of children who laugh and dance and sing as if joy is the very thing that keeps them alive. Maybe they have joy figured out. Gratefully, we pray.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, the Lord has done great things for us. Though we have gone out in tears, God has brought us home with shouts of joy. So friends, hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the forgiven people of the risen Christ, I encourage you to share God's love and peace with someone you know this morning by text or by email from a distance or sitting side by side. So friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Creator God, to our human ears, there are times when these words can sound like nothing more than a far-off dream, downplaying prophecy to fantasy. But what we know is that to dream is to hope, and to hope is to imagine, and to imagine is to wonder, and to wonder is to believe, and to believe is to live and breathe for your promised day. Give us strength to listen as we dream, O oh God, for deep down we know your words are the very thing we need. Amen. The first reading from today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. The Lord God's Spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for captives and liberation for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and dishonesty. I will faithfully give them their wage and make with them an enduring covenant. Their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people blessed by the Lord. I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with clothes of victory, wrapped me in a robe of righteousness like a bridegroom in a priestly crown, and like a bride adorned in jewelry as the earth puts out its growth and as a garden grows its seeds, so the Lord God will grow righteousness and praise before all the nations. The second reading is Psalm 126 from the Common English Bible. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was as though we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful sounds. It was even said at that time among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. Lord, change our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in the desert waste. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts.
carrying bales of grain. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Advent. This Sunday we remember the joy that the birth of Jesus brings into our lives. We'd love for all our young people to lean in just a little bit closer. Hey Mark. Hey Mel. I feel like we so often get to, so rarely get to spend time together like this and it, it just makes me happy to see you and be able to have a conversation with you. Because I realize that you're still kind of new here and I'm I'm still getting to know you and Jenna, and I just wondered, like, what brings you joy? Oh, so many things bring me joy. Uh, I think of, you know, enjoying my mom and dad's arroz con gandules y bistec con salsa verde, mm. uh, long walks with our dog Leo, uh, exploring new cities with my wife Jenna and eating good food, and just hanging out with friends and family. I agree, but it kind of sounds like those are things that make you happy, and I'm wondering about what gives you joy, because I, I do think there's a difference, right? I mean, I'm happy too when I'm on a walk, or when both my boys are home from school. I mean, mostly I'm happy when both my boys are home from school. I'm definitely happy when I'm eating peppermint ice cream, as I'm <laughs> sure you are too. I'm happy when I'm spending time with people who are happy, but I mean something different, something different. What brings you joy? Hmm. I think I know what you're getting at. It, it can be a little confusing. It might be helpful to remember the difference between happiness and joy. Mm -hmm. now, happiness is what you're doing, our, our circumstances. The things that make us happy are where we are, who we're with, the weather, what we're doing. What make us happy can just as quickly make us unhappy. That is so true. I mean, if the weather is great and you're on the beach in Florida playing with your best friend in the sand, of course it's easy to be happy. But then if you find yourself in a snowstorm stuck on the interstate in a car and you have to go to the bathroom, there's nothing happy about that. Joy is different. It's something deeper. It's, it's wider. It's less vulnerable to change. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, that's right. Happiness is a state you're in and you can move just as quickly through mm. it. Think of driving through this 
wonderful, beautiful state we call Michigan. Mm -hmm. and be so happy. And then you hit that place to the south of us we call Ohio and maybe be not so happy. <laughs> I get that. I surely get that. But joy is something bigger. It's wider. It's deeper. It's the whole place you live. It's your country. I mean, it's a way of being, right? Yeah. Happiness is something we feel kind of shallow, maybe even a little selfish or perhaps self-centered. But joy is something deeper. It, it moves inside of us. And joy is, you know, intimately connected to others, to other people. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling we have and live in when everyone has what they need. It's not about the things around us, but the way they are. Happiness is short-lived. The weather changes. You go from happiness to sadness. When you have it, um, it's, it can be fleeting, right? But joy lasts. It's, it's something longer. When you have it, nothing like shallow, nothing shallow like the changing weather or the food you're eating can change it. Yeah. And as, as Christian people, as Advent people, we think of joy in a particular way, don't we? It's something we have from God. It, it's a gift. It's a gift we have, all have, given freely, and it begins in our God making us in God's image, in giving us the gift of God's Son, Jesus, and in being with us always through the Holy Spirit. Joy comes because no matter who we are or what we've done, God will always, always, always love us, mm. always forgive us, and always help us. And we are free then to love God and do our best to keep trying to live grateful lives because we're never alone. Yes. So today we are remembering the joy that comes in the birth of Jesus. There was so much joy, even with all the unhappy parts of that story. Mary and Joseph had to travel, give birth in a stable, and they were surely afraid, perhaps even a little hungry. Life was hard then. Herod was out to, you know, get rid of Jesus' arrival. But there's a lot to be unhappy about. But joy came from God in Christ, and it's never left. It's unending, forever, life-changing. It's the way we live our lives, not the way we feel just now. Right. So, back to you. Ah. What gives you joy? Knowing Jesus, knowing God through my loved ones, knowing God in this church, in our community, and life of faith. Ah, so joy comes in being a part of others. Mm, yeah, that's right. Joy is something we share together. We don't have it by ourselves. But we are in a pandemic. We are quarantined. Doesn't that kind of steal our joy? You know, make it harder because... If we're all a part of this joy, what's that like when we're a part? We are a part, Mal, but only in this slight way. We are still together in spirit. We are together in our prayers. We are together online when we gather in various different ways. We are together because God makes us one family, one church. And God is right here with us, making us one community. Amen, brother. I think we should say a prayer. Would you join? Absolutely. All right, let's pray for all this joy. Thank you, God, for happy times. They are precious to us. But thank you more for the joy that we share, especially at this time of year, for our community, for our being together, even when we are apart, for Jesus, for our Lord and our Savior, and for the joy that we have unending because of his presence in our lives. All these things we give you thanks in Christ our Lord. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. Thanks. A reading from John's Gospel. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. This is John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? John confessed, he didn't deny, but he confessed that I am not the Christ. 
So they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? John said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And John answered, no. They asked then, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied, I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness, making the Lord path straight, just as the prophet Isaiah said. Those sent by the Pharisees asks, Why do you baptize if you aren't the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered, I baptize with water. Someone greater stands among you whom you don't recognize. He comes after me, but I'm not worthy to untie his sandal straps. And this encounter took place across the Jordan in Bethany, where John was baptizing. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. Long before Advent was a word, it was a sigh. It was a voice weeping, a mood, a heart broken, and never more intently felt than in these anxious mid-December days. Advent expresses both the fatigue and the joyful hope of God's people when the meaning of our lives is expressed in a tired exhalation of ordinary breath, followed by the sharp intake of something greater. The poetry and art and prayers of this season all begin with a cry for deliverance. It was first voiced not by a poet or a hymn writer, but by a prophet. Oh, Oh, that thou wouldst rent the heavens and come down. And it's reflected in this 10th century Gregorian prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come to us today. Rescue and protect us from the threatening perils. O Lord, this Advent is a season of grief of what rightly be can rightly be called a season of acedia, the ancient deadly sin of sloth, or our present mood of listlessness, or apathy, or melancholy. The church's challenge in Advent is usually to prevent the vast Christmas machine from stampeding our hearts and minds and spirits just over the edge of the cliff of commercial conviviality. Honestly, I don't believe it will be a challenge for us to mark an authentic Advent this year. The pandemic has imposed upon us both a dual sense of melancholy and some keen anticipation about what comes next. If the prophets and poets are right about us, and I sense that they are, then for whom do we Christians sigh in this Advent? For whom do we dream and for what do we dream? We dream for Emmanuel, the God who is with us. The ancient church waited for the final reckoning of the Lord with fasting and prayer and repentance. Our forebears sang just like we do, come thou long expected Jesus, but Today we do not long for a second coming, not one that would bring our world to a final end. Instead, we pray for the inbreaking of Christ that will allow our world to continue. Advent is for us the doorway to God's incarnation. It's when God changed tack about what it means to be God and went all in. And God chose a maximum and unconditional investment in our human lives. And so it was that Jesus was born in the days when an overhyped Roman emperor named Caesar ruled nearly everything, and a political non entity named Quirinius administered Syria, and an even lesser light, Herod, oversaw Israel. Jesus was born into that world, the same world that we occupy, a world of gloom and misgovernment and 
and also indescribable splendor, a planet on which we make and we take out the garbage. We do our laundry in the basement and watch for the northern lights in the December sky. Advent pays close attention to this world into which Jesus came, and it takes it seriously. So every Advent we ask, what is it about our world that made Jesus coming necessary? And then thoughtfully we ponder, just how are we changed as a result of his coming? John the Baptist plays a matchless role in our Advent story. Not as a prophet of joy, of course, that would be out of character for such a cryptic and hard-edged figure. But he is a unique witness to what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Scripture declares that John sent, that God sent John. And no other than John is sent by God in such a unique way. John grouds all the beautiful images of the first words of John's gospel. The words about the word made flesh, the light shining in the darkness, glory, glory that's full of grace and truth in the here and the now. John places the one who has existed from the beginning of all time, Jesus Christ, in our history in our lives, in our time. John places the word through who all things come into being in a specific place with a particular Google address. In Bethany, across the Jordan from where John was baptizing. The good news that John brings into our world, our lives, is that Jesus is present here with us with all humanity in the here and now. The very light of God is in this confused and politically divided and racially complex and coronavirus-infested world. I think God sent us John because God knows the world around us is often dark and fearsome and that sometimes we need someone outrageous to point Jesus out to us. For sometimes we have trouble seeing the light and feeling the joy. For though the darkness cannot overcome the light, the darkness can be pretty thick. And so God sends witnesses like John to point to the light. The distinctive portrait of John the Baptist makes clear that God sends the light that brings light. We don't have to conjure the light or create life for ourselves. John's call is to bring people to Jesus is not the way that we save ourselves. No, the repentance that we take up in our deep Advent sighs is the grace that brings us the joy of new and splendid hope. On this third Sunday of Advent, we have wisdom that first comes from the psalmist that John read, and then from John, and then finally from Paul about this counterintuitive way to live in this disheveled world. It begins, according to the psalmist, with a sign of an imminent restoration in the midst of an experience of a massive disruptive exile. It's much like the good news that's flooded into the world this week with the appearance of an effective vaccine against COVID-19. Laughter and shouts of joy are signs of the coming resurrection, so says the psalmist. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. I don't know if you saw it, but when Margaret Keenan, the grandmother from Coventry in England, received the very first Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine early on Tuesday morning, 
she couldn't help but suppress a small, tiny, wry chuckle. The drama of being the first person in the world to be jabbed with a vaccine brought out in her a spontaneous touch of delight at that sense that hope and joy were about to unfold around her. A handful of verses come to us from the oldest book in the New Testament, Thessalonians, that speaks of a similar contraindicated truth in this season of size. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. These words come from Paul's very first letter and are addressed to a community of people he particularly loved. And as our community today eagerly awaits a fresh, new, common life together and an end to this massive suffering, the church in Thessalonica was waiting impatiently for restoration as well. And what does Paul advise in those times? Rejoice. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice? It seems misguided, but it all leads me to wonder if joy isn't really a muscle that invites us to just exercise it constantly. John Calvin, the Swiss pastor and theologian and, well, the architect of our Presbyterian lineage, was fond of saying that there is not one blade of grass, there is no color in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. On his most recent visit to the United States, I remember that Pope Francis began his message by audaciously reminding Christians to rejoice. Paul tells us to rejoice, the Pope said. Well, he practically orders us to rejoice. This command resonates with the desire we have for a fulfilling life, a meaningful life, a joyful life. It is as if Paul could hear what each one of us is thinking in his or her heart and to voice what we are feeling, what we are experiencing. Something deep within us invites us to rejoice and tells us not to settle. It's in observing the turns of our liturgical year that mark this third Sunday of Advent in which joy is featured center stage that helps me and helps all of us to reframe our mindset. Surpassing the individual sorrows and sharing and communal rejoicing are ways of proclaiming something that's fundamentally true, that we have good reason to rejoice that God and Jesus Christ is alive and present in this very moment in time, and that joy, not anxiety, not acedia, will have the last word. The Reverend Talitha Armour Arnold, uh, a Yale classmate of both Rick Spaulding and mine, was fond of saying that joy comes to us where it has no business being. Joy comes not from our deserving, but joy comes from God's doing. So it helps to remember that joy can also be quite quiet. For joy isn't just an emotion, it's a way of knowing. All joy reminds, wrote C.S. Lewis, and surprised by joy, for it confirm, confirms what we know and what we believe about God who is and who we are created to be. It reminds us that we are loved into being by a love that is far greater than any force on this earth and that we are accompanied in each and every step on each and every moment and that we are watched over in our journeys and that our sorrows will melt into tremendous delight when we arrive again at the place where we started. But face it, folks, the facts are grim, and the list is long and growing. This winter looks dark. Global temperatures are rising. 
severe weather events are more common and more severe. Species are becoming extinct at an alarming rate, and rainforests are vanishing. Slavery has not been abolished, nor its legacy reconciled. Poverty continues, as does injustice, and the proud boys still roam the streets. Innocent people are killed and their homes destroyed for no good reason. Wendell Berry, whose poem Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front, informs me today, is one who does consider the facts and yet witnesses to the presence of a deep joy. He's spoken prophetically to generations about the economic, communal, and environmental disasters that we have created by greed and short-sightedness and by the substitution of what he dubs ownership rather than stewardship. It's all an inappropriate goal for our lives, he says. Barry describes the looming catastrophes we're aware of, losing relationships, the loss of the natural processes, environmental racism, soil depletion, the removal of mountaintops, unbridled prejudice, overconsumption, and the dilapidation of community. But yet his long life as a farmer and writer offers a rich example of how, in spite of circumstances, it is possible to rejoice, though you have considered the facts. It's not a simple glib line of verse. Joy that survives the bleak statistics of a dark winter of Isolation born when families are not able to gather around the Christmas tree and there are no visits to the care facility to sing carols of good cheer. This kind of joy is the fruit of a practical faith, one that Barry witnesses too when he writes that work done faithfully and well is a prayer of joy. Joy is the fruit of endurance and patience, it's formed, as we know, in communities of people who care for one another, who laugh over each other's missteps, who listen deeply to each other's stories, invest in each other's children and grandchildren, and grieve each other's dings and losses, and live together through tragedy into joy and celebration. This sort of rejoicing may be possible only in the context of human connections that are struck and forged and welded by love and molded by grace and forgiveness. It may be possible only by clinging to Jesus' evocative promise and reassurance. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. In light of that promise, we can consider the facts and perhaps find a way. Beyond our relationships with each other, there is, as we know, quiet glory and inspiration in the natural world. In another piece, Wendell Berry writes this. He says, there's not only peacefulness in the world, but there is joy. And the joy is less deniable in the evidence than the peacefulness in the confirmation of it. He says, I sat one summer evening and watched a great blue heron make his descent from the top of the hill into the valley. He came down at a measured and deliberate pace, stately as always, like a dignitary going down the stair. And then at a point I judged to be midway over the river. Without it all varying his wing beat, he did a backward turn in the air, a loop the loop. It could only have been a gesture of pure exuberance, of joy. The speaking of his sense of the evening of the day's fulfillment, his descent homeward, he made just that one slow turn and then flew on out of sight in the direction of the slough further down the bottom. The movement was incredibly beautiful, at once exultant and stately, a benediction on the evening and on the river and upon me. It seems so perfectly to confirm the presence of a free 
joy in the world. Just last Sunday, I was walking with my Labrador retrievers in Hudson Mill Park in Dexter. We were following the path that leads along the waters of the Huron River when I spotted a great blue heron flying low over the river, gliding effortlessly above the waters. I watched as the heron turned and flew back upstream in our direction, and I was left to wonder what this great bird knew of joy. Thanks be to God for the joy given in the life of Jesus Christ, who has loved us all. Amen and amen. Grace and peace to you, friends, and welcome to worship with the family of First Presbyterian Church on this Sunday in the season of Advent. I'm Rick Spaulding. I'm the interim pastor here. And whoever you are, you are welcome to worship with this family of faith. And we'd like to know who you are, so we hope you'll find your way to the virtual pew pad friendship pad on our website and record the fact of your presence here along with any prayer requests or other comments that you have so that we can reach out to you and welcome you more fully into the heart of our life together as a community. We'd also like to invite you to coffee hour virtually again, of course, uh, immediately after the service. There's a link on the website uh, that will help you find your way into a more informal conversation um, with other members of our community. And the conversation at Coffee Hour this week is sure to revolve around the subject of joy, about which I know you have a great deal to say. So please do come and join us for a few minutes after the service. We urge you to take note of all of the events of the life and times of this congregation that are described in the worship bulletin that hopefully you're using to enrich your participation in our service. We're eager to hear from you about your interest in any of our programs or participating in any of the events that are coming. So we hope you'll let us know about that. 
and you'll find there, too, information about how to give to support the ministries of outreach and compassion that are part of the ongoing life of this church. This is the moment in our liturgy each week when we pause to consider our gifts, our stewardship of the blessings that are ours, and to draw from them, draw strength and encouragement from them to reach out to the wider world. So we hope you'll take these moments to give. There are several ways that that's possible that you'll find described in the bulletin, a QR code and text to give, and the old-fashioned way by UP, uh, the United States Postal Service. Dear friends, freely, so freely, we have received. Even so, let us freely give and let us dedicate our offerings in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, in the company of Jesus, you have opened our eyes to joy even when it is dark. In the community of Jesus, you have opened our arms to compassion, even when the world around us is cold and harsh. And in the work of Jesus, you have nudged our consciences toward generosity, even in a culture that prizes having and keeping and owning. Your spirit is indeed upon us, and you have called us again to offer your good news to the world, your blessing in solidarity and caring, your word in justice and compassion, your presence in food and shelter, your tidings of comfort and joy. May these, our offerings, help to enable us to live our best intentions. And may they help you to hold this beloved, beautiful, wounded world tenderly in the embrace of your care. For we make these gifts in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Apostle Paul taught us to believe that even when we can't find the words to loft our prayers, the Spirit itself intercedes for us and rides the breath of our sighs, carrying our prayers to the heart of God. Dear friends, may our hearts lean together in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Your spirit is indeed upon us, O Lord, because you have urged us to bring cheer and courage to those who walk through the darkness of this world. We lift up now into the light and peace of your embrace those names we know as well as we know our own names who today are struggling to find a way or see the light. And we lift up as well those who are strangers to us but whose names are written on your heart, who today are lost or bereft or exhausted. Help us to hear our own prayers, calling us to join the hands of our caring with the hands of your enlivening love. Your spirit is indeed upon us, O Lord, because you have called us to proclaim release to those who live in bondage to despair and bitterness and cynicism. We lift up now into the hope and healing of your care, those whose faces we see in our heart's eye now, who today are carrying the heavy load of anger or disappointment or disillusionment. And we lift up as well those whose paths have not crossed ours, but whose ways are in your sight, whose burdens you know. Help us to hear our own prayers calling us to meet you on the way in the warm company of your hope-restoring love. Your spirit is indeed upon us, O Lord, because you have woven us, even us, into your dream of peace for this world. We lift up now into the calm and the joy of your companionship, those whose lives unfold so close to our own, who are burdened with illness, who today are worried or fearful, in mourning or in pain. And we lift up as well those whose lives unfold far from ours, whose bodies are broken or wounded, whose lungs labor for every breath, whose minds grow dim, or whose grasp on life is slipping. Help us to hear our own prayers, calling us to meet you in the healing touch of your tender and vigilant care. Teach us, O oh Lord, as we pray, to dream with you of a time when struggle is met by care and sorrow is transformed to rejoicing. And give us courage, we pray, to follow these, our prayers, out into your world to sow love. In the name of Christ, for the sake of Christ, 
in the company of Christ, who taught us how to pray and gave us the words to say together with confidence and even with great joy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. go out into the world with justice and compassion in your heart. Hear the voices of those long silenced. See strength in what has been deemed weak. But most of all, see one another, hear one another, care for one another, love one another. It's all that easy and it's all that hard. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always as you go in peace. Amen.